Welcome to the Education Marketing Leader Podcast with Chris Raposo. If you're looking to dive into the latest industry insights, draw inspiration from education success stories, or just want to sharpen your marketing skills, you're in the right place. Here, we bring you a diverse range of voices from experts and leaders in the field, offering you a unique blend of professional development and practical strategies. Whether you want to understand your audience better, stay updated with the latest tech trends in marketing, or expand your professional network, we've got you covered. So while you're driving on your morning commute or winding down after a busy day, let's explore the dynamic world of education marketing together. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Education Marketing Leader with Chris Raposo. Today, I have a special guest joining me from Maryland. Her name is Abby Humble, and she's the Digital Marketing Manager at Hagerstown Community College. Abby, welcome to the show. Hello, thanks for having me. So I met Abby at the NCMPR National Conference in Seattle, Washington a couple of weeks ago, and she had a presentation on influencer marketing, and we'll focus the episode on that. But but before we go into this, we'll do a little bit of intro. Um, on Abby, so Abby, I I read, did you have a degree in communications with a track of PR, public relations from the University of Maryland, and you currently work at Hagerstown Community College as the digital marketing manager, but you've worked in marketing for the past five years or so, and you joined Hagerstown Community College about a year ago. What attracted you to higher education marketing? So during my time at the University of Maryland, when I was a student, um, I had a couple internships with the Alumni Association there. Um, I worked with the events department and did some advocacy and engagement stuff like blog writing. Um, So I kind of got involved with like the marketing side of higher ed through that internship. And my mom's a teacher, an elementary school teacher. So I've always sort of been interested in the education fields. Um but wanted a way to be creative in that. So it led me here and I really like working in higher ed marketing. So. Yeah, I can tell looking at the presentation that you did, um, I could just see you have a passion for it and a natural inclination to um, put a good spotlight on a higher ed institution like Hagerstown Community College. So since your um, NCMPR presentation was on influencer marketing, just let's continue the conversation because I found it very intriguing. So to start off, could you explain what student influencer marketing is and why Hagerstown Community College has decided to integrate it into its marketing strategy? So student influencer marketing, um, it's where we use real students who are helping us create content to put on social media um, to promote the school, promote programs, clubs, events, anything you could really think of, um, balanced with like a little bit of trendy content. So relatable things about the school and the area, um, just following trends that are ever changing that you see on social media. Um, And we chose to start doing this at Hagerstown because, you know, influencer marketing has grown a lot. And in my presentation, um, I asked if anybody has been influenced to buy something, buy a product, and a lot of people raised their hands. My example was my Stanley cup that I have sitting right here on my desk. They, um, Stanley used influencer marketing a lot. And that was like a huge product around the holiday season. I know people were buying. um, So of course we're selling the product of education, but a way to be authentic online. So a lot of what you see on social media is, is not authentic and can be misconstrued and, um, edited and things like that. So we wanted a way to show real students who prospective students and current students can relate to and um, kind of see themselves in. So Mm -hmm. we wanted to um, add an aspect of authenticity that we didn't already have. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because sometimes um, social media can be somebody's life's highlight reel. And the same with with a polished ad, right? It's just so scripted that it could be, you know, people may think about it as just being, being a sales pitch, but if you have the actual practitioners, the actual students having that sort of social proof there, it's like in B2B marketing where you are using customer spotlights, right? It's kind of like putting a spotlight on the the students to show prospective students 
what a day in the life of a Hagerstown community college student yeah. really looks like, you know? So right. I like that example that you shared with the day in the life and, and those sort of um, strategic um, videos and, and posts. Yeah. And like, we want, we want prospective students to see them and think like, this could be me next year. This is what my life would look like, you know, a day in my life would look like. Um, so that's, that was where we were going, what we were going for with the influencers. What yeah. What a, yeah. Many of the, of the listeners, they're, they're always keen on understanding, you know, the unique benefits of student influencer marketing, if they want to invest into it. Now, you've done it for about a year now. So based on your experience, what advantages, advantages does it have to have student influencers market your institution? Um, we've noticed that our engagement has grown a lot with influencer marketing. Um, I think it's because with real people, like we said, it's authentic, it's more personable, and it's a little bit more casual than such a scripted ad graphic or even professional videos i mean there's definitely like there's definitely value still in professional videos but it will seem more scripted and things like that so having that kind of off the cuff raw real um authentic phone video that a student has taken just people seem to relate to it and i also say like seeing is believing so seeing real students um talk about hcc being a good option good choice for them you know that really seems to speak to prospective students who are thinking about coming here. Hey, that's funny that you said HCC. I went to a community college that was called HCC <laughs> as well. It was um, Hillsborough Community College out of Tampa, Florida. But that's just an aside. So um, yeah, there's a lot of HCCs, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think there's Houston Community College as well. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, can you share some examples on um, student influencer campaigns at Hagerstown uh, Community College that stand out to you? I know there were a few of them that you spotlighted during your presentation at yeah. NCMPR. What works best? Um. So an example that I showed at my presentation, Um. we do a lot during like midterms and final season because that's like the one thing that students are stressed and they relate to like, you know, <laughs> venting about their stress, that kind of thing. So we had a video recently with our influencer, Rachel. Um, it was a trending audio that I found and saw an example of, and it said, I will pass all my exams. I know what's going on. Kind of like it was an affirmation. Like she was just like putting the information into her head um, without seeing it. it's kind of hard to explain, but that did really well. It was really short, only a few seconds long, but with the trending audio in combination with the relatable topic, um, I guess it was, I mean, it was good timing and that got, I don't want to misspeak, but I think like 23,000 views, which is really high for us. <laughs> Another one, um, well, we talked about the day in the life videos. Those don't necessarily like blow up like that, but they still um, have gotten like 200 some likes, which is high for us. And those seem to do well, um, get high engagement because people like the kind of behind the scenes VIP look at things. Um, so that's another example of ones that have done pretty well. Yeah, and there, there, there's some fun ones in there too, like um, asking instructors to read their own reviews and that sort of stuff, you know? Yeah, and that, I mean, that wasn't our influencers, but that was an idea. And it was inspired by um, Cape Fear Community College. I have to give them a shout out because <laughs> it was inspired by something that they did with their professors too. Okay, so, so I know you started about a year and a half ago or so at Hagerstown. Uh, yeah, I've almost, this summer will be two years. So. Okay. Did you implement the influencer marketing or did it exist before you started? It, um, so I, it started while I was here, but I was in a different position. Um, so my supervisor, who is my predecessor, started the guidelines and the application and things like that. And she um, did the first round of having two student influencers. Mm -hmm. So I did not completely like start it from the ground up, but it um when I came into this position about a year ago, it had a lot of room and opportunity to grow. Okay. You you just mentioned guidelines. So yeah. to build a student influencer program from the ground up can seem daunting to higher ed marketers that already have a lot on their plate. So what initial steps do you take to identify and recruit student influencers? So I, I think there's a lot of resources out there with schools that already have these guidelines. I mean, we're one example <laughs> on our website. They're all um, on the webpage, which is hagerstowncc.edu slash influencer if you want to see the specific guidelines. But we kind of started by um, 
having like what's the quantity going to be like how many events they have to attend per semester how many videos they're responsible for recording um we don't have like set hours that they're working or like set meetings it's they're signed on to um as independent contractors so they get the work done in like on their own time whenever they're able to do it but i'll give them deadlines i mean it's kind of a it's not a super structured sort of thing it's I mean, we just, when we interview people, try to see, you know, who has the time for this and we'll be able to turn something around pretty quickly mm -hmm. um, because trends are changing so quickly. Anyway, so back to the guidelines. Um, yeah, so we just wrote down the quantitative things that we wanted to have. And then we vet the students um, as far as like behavioral, academic, and um, which one am I missing? Financial standing, that mm -hmm. they're in good standing at the college because okay. we want um, students who are a good representation of our brand and no one that has any any issues or outstanding things. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So as a as a KPI, let's say per semester, how many videos should or, or social posts should they produce? Um, we do around four with them. And then they're also required to like share a couple of our other posts to their stories. I can't remember the exact number that we even have for that. Um, but if I know I posted some like a promo for something or an event that I want to like really get out to the student population, I'll have them put it on their like put the posts on their story or share it on Facebook or whatever. That's right. And I think you mentioned during the during the conference that they create the videos or the posts and then they send them to you, right? They're not, they don't have access to the social media page. So they record like the raw clips, like they send me all of the clips and I actually put it together. Like I edit the videos um, and then I post to the main pages that, I mean, that could change in the future. It's, it's maybe not the most efficient way to do it, but I also like tend to have a vision for what I want. And if they, give me more than enough it's easier to crop it down than like have to go back and ask them for to send me more or to change how they edited it yeah so. that's actually an easy lift for them you know to just do the right. videos and then send them to you and you do that the editing the music and whatever and then post it shouldn't yeah. be too hard you know as in a yeah. as a job i guess if you get a little bit of a stipend there but um trust and authenticity are crucial um in influencer marketing you know, how do you ensure that student influencers maintain these values that you have while promoting a college's brand? Um, so, you know, part of it is during the interview process. So we have them apply and we ask questions like, why did you choose to come to HCC? What do you like most about it? Things where we can really tell if they're passionate about the institution or if they, you know, just want, and I don't think I mentioned, but we give a $500 stipend per semester. So if they just want the money, you can kind of start to tell with those answers. And then we bring them in for an in-person interview and can kind of go into that even more. Um, and then another thing to like make it authentic, I'll meet with them or text with them when I have an idea for a video and an example, um, of where they kind of put me in check for like the student perspective was we were doing that trend that's like, um, I'm an HCC student. Of course, I see hedge apples everywhere I go. And that's something on our campus. They're like these big green hedge apples. Um, Osage oranges, I think is the <laughs> real name. They fall on the ground. So we did a video like that and I was writing down ideas for what we could say. And one of mine was um, being out of breath, walking up the hill to the student center. And they were like, well, we don't really walk up that hill a lot. That kind of comes from the administration building where like it's mostly just offices. So that was more of like a staff relatable thing. They were like, but we do have to walk up a bunch of stairs to get to the STEM building. Can we do that instead? So like it's good to have their input on like the real student experience because I'm like, I, you know, I don't have to walk up those stairs all the time. That's something I wouldn't think of. So they can help with that, um, that perspective. That, that makes it 100% authentic, right? If it's actually yeah. something that students do and if current students are watching this is like, hey, this is a total relatability play <laughs> here. Um, this is what I do. And yeah, I like that you said that you, you vet them, you know, make sure that they're 
that they're aligned with your vision, with the mission of the institution, because if they fully bought into the institution, then you know you're going to get a lot better product out of them as if they're just in it for the money, like you said. So um, I think it's very important to think about when hiring student influencers. So let's talk about metrics a little bit, you know, because you, I mean, obviously you're spending your time on it. You're paying money <laughs> to the influencers there. So engagement metrics are often used to measure success of influencer marketing campaigns. What specific metrics do you use? So I do a monthly um, social media marketing report where I kind of take inventory of like everything we did on social media that month and list um, views, engagement, reach, all the different <laughs> all the different metrics that you can get from the analytics tools from social media. Um, so I do that each month, but specifically for the influencer videos, when I'm judging those um, versus our other short form social media videos, I look at views maybe the most um, because that mm -hmm. kind of shows me like how many people saw it. Also engagement, just engagement of the post and then compare that to other posts in that month. So mm -hmm. that's kind of how I do it. There's no perfect way, I don't think, to to measure those things, but um, they're usually, the engagement and views will both be a lot higher than other posts. So it's kind of just an obvious <laughs> thing yeah. when they measure high that it, we're getting a good return. Do you ask those influencers to actually share those videos on their own uh, page or do they do it automatically because they're proud of their their association with the school? Um, they don't post like to their feed, but uh -huh. they, so I, it's part of our guidelines that they share the videos to their story. So they put the post on their story and we've actually had an influencer who, um, you know, on Instagram, you can invite someone to be a collaborator and it shows like Hagerstown CC and Jackson posted this. So we've actually done that with him before where like their the post that I make also shows up um, as a feed post from him. That's not a requirement, but that's kind of like a, you're really proud of this and want to do it. Like, why not? Because he has that audience of other students and um, high school students who might be prospective students and things like that. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because I, um, I participated in a couple of spotlights for my alma mater, the University of Florida, and they never asked me to share anything, but because I was so bought in, um, you know, I, I was sure to share this with everybody that I knew, whether it was dark social or just forwarded them or shared on my LinkedIn page, you know, it's just because, like you said, you, you want to find students that are fully bought in. I'm fully bought into that institution that I went to. So sometimes when you have the right students, you don't even have to ask, you know, they'll, they'll do that automatically. And so do their parents when I mean, they're proud of their, their kids, you know, they're like, oh my gosh, look, my, my son and my daughter um, are featured on this university or college uh, social media page. I'll be sure to tell my friends as well. So it's kind of like how that, that word of mouth spreads. Yep. And that's like, again, something that you can kind of just tell based off of interviews and applications, like yeah. who, you know, would really be proud of their work and proud of where they go to school and want to share um, to their personal pages. So diversity is obviously very important when um, a, a key aspect to college life. When you interview these students, do you put that into consideration to make sure it's inclusive and it represents the entire student body? Or do you, you know, go by who has the most followers on their personal Instagram? Um, we d definitely don't go by the number of followers. I mean, that is a question that we ask and I ask for their um, personal social media handles just to see partially like what type of content they're posting to make sure it's appropriate and go a good representation of our brand. Um, but the number of followers, I mean, that is more on there like if we came down to, wow, we have like 10 really great candidates and we can only take two, which is what we're doing right now. Um, you know, it might just have to be based on <laughs> who has a bigger audience. But as far as diversifying our student influencers, we definitely take that into account um, to a certain extent. We try to have, you know, males and females, um, different races, ethnicities, um, as well as different majors and 
different things that they're involved in, like different clubs, whether they're an athlete or not, um, early college, like all, all different things like that. And we have not yet had a non-credit student or like a non-traditional student, but I would like to have that in the future. Um, it's a little bit more difficult to reach that audience, <laughs> but, and so, yeah, so we try with all the different demographics um, because we want to represent the student body as a whole. And we want prospective students to be able to see someone who has similar interests to them, mm -hmm. who um, have similar backgrounds to them and things like that so that they can relate to the content because that's what it's all about is being relatable and authentic. So we definitely try to have a diverse group. Um, we've only done it we've only had two groups as of right yeah. now. <laughs> so we're working on expanding. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense, especially when it comes to non-traditional adult learners, right? Because they have that schedule that may not align with your schedule. So if you have to film something on campus and they won't get there until it's dark and maybe a little bit more difficult, but um, you know, it also depends on your target audience who you're trying to reach. Like if, yeah. if, if, if adult learners aren't the, the, the prospective students, then why bother? Um, having them there, you know, it just depends yeah. on the institution's goal. For I was going to mention that too, like the audience on social media really isn't um mm -hmm. the older demographic, but as far as like non-credit programs, such as trades and things like that, um, areas of study that like we haven't really touched on the non-credit programs as much. And I sort of have a soft spot for that area of the college because when I started here, I was, um, the workforce solutions and continuing education marketing coordinator. So I got a really good foundation of like learning about the value in those non-credit programs too. So I um, always yeah. try to make sure we try to integrate that. And that's part of our strategic plan right now too, is to integrate all parts of the college. So how much creative freedoms do the influencers get um, when they create their videos? Uh, you know, you just you want to make sure they align with with the marketing goals, but you also want to make sure that you don't put so many guidelines on them that it's no longer natural for them. Um. So the way it works, like I usually have some kind of inspirational or inspiration to send to them to have them kind of either recreate or maybe I have an idea that's similar to like using that audio, but I want them to do something different. Um. Because we want it to be authentic or not authentic, but we want it to be different content than what everyone else is sharing. Of course, we don't want to copy everyone else, but trends are all about kind of copying and like making it your own. Um, but I usually start out with something that I send them to give them direction um, to see it and see an example. And then I, I mean, if they, it seems like they have, I feel like they have creative freedom because when I say do a day in the life, you know, I don't really know exactly what they'll be doing in that day. So it's whatever they decide to capture. I don't tell them like, you have to get a clip of you doing homework at your house. You have to get one of doing it in a building on campus. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, I want it to be real. What are they really doing <laughs> in their day? So um, that kind of thing, you know, I leave it up to them what they want to take clips of. Um, and then of course, I try to make sure that the communication is open and that they feel comfortable sharing any ideas they have with me um, because they are the tar target audience. So if they see something that maybe I'm not seeing and it's a trend or it's a type of video idea, then I'm always open to hearing their suggestions too. They're, in marketing, social media marketing, when it comes to influencer marketing, is it mostly entertaining content that you have them create or do you have them create promotional content as well? Um, I try to have a little bit of a balance. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want it all to be just entertaining content. I like to try and tie it back into some kind of informational or professional point that we have, like um, an example this wasn't an influencer, but we used like how the green screen kind of social media videos are trending um, that you can create through CapCut, I believe. But we did one of, um, it's a kid holding a Nemo thing and he, you may have seen it, but he says, 
where's my dad? I'm all alone. He's like singing. I'm not going to sing, but um, (laughs) he has that. And we put it about when school was starting for incoming first year students, like feeling lost without guidance of their parents or their guardians and teachers and things like that. Um, But it was kind of just like a funny, like relatable video. And then I was like, I feel like it needs like a little bit more depth to it so we tied it into um advising was doing like some tours around campus and things like leading up to the first day of classes so we tied it into those like walk-in tours and advising meetings so that was kind of a way to make it promotional but also keep it fun and entertaining um sometimes it's just just for entertainment and just to show that coming to HTC is fun and we're fun here (laughs) and we have, you know, a good, you know, um, personality, I guess. But... That's right. Great energy on campus, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Now, let's say somebody's listening to this episode and they want to get into student influencer marketing. What is a key piece of advice you could share with them how they should get started? Getting started, I would suggest to start with trying to lay out those guidelines. Um, and you could definitely find some examples and but make sure you make it your own and things that are going to serve your institution specifically. Um, depending, like if you need more event coverage because your staff is like a, a small staff and you need students who are able to get like um, on day of coverage of events or things like that. So think about like your needs and what you want those guidelines to be. And then I would suggest like going into it you don't, like I mentioned it not being super structured. I think there's a little bit of a benefit to that because trends and social media are always changing and they're changing really quickly. So you don't want to feel stuck to like what your original plan of content was or what your content calendar was going to be. And we know as higher ed um, professionals, like marketing professionals, that things come up all the time to promote and lots of last minute requests come in. So I think if you can, I'm a planner. So like trying to let go of that a little bit and kind of like at the beginning of a semester with a new influencer, rough out a few ideas. Like I know we want to do a video about finals week and we want to do a video at graduation, like loose ideas like that, but then also being flexible with when you get like kind of a last minute request for promotion and you think, oh, I could pivot and use an influencer to make this engaging since it's sort of last minute. Yeah. Um, and of course, that depends on the time you have and the time the influencer has too. But just sort of letting <laughs> letting it be a little bit flexible and free throughout the semester is good. But then also kind of roughing in where you think um, some content might be needed. Okay. Very good. Great advice. Super show. Thank you so much, Abby. Really appreciate all the insights you shared today. Now, if people want to get in touch with you to connect with you to learn a little bit more about you and influencer marketing, what's the best way to reach you? Um, So you can email me. My email is ajhumble, H-U-M-B-E-L at hagerstowncc.edu. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. My name is Abby Humble on there. And of course, subtle plug to follow our Hagerstown Community College social media. It's Hagerstown CC. <laughs> awesome. Very good. I'll be sure to uh, leave that in the show notes so people can connect with you and follow your page. All right, Abby, thank you so much for being part of the show. I really appreciate you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. <laughs> All right, cool. See ya. Bye. Hey, thanks so much for tuning into the show today. If you enjoyed it, don't keep it to yourself. Share with your friends in your network. And if you have a moment, I would really appreciate a review of the podcast. That'll help other people find the show as well. Tune in every Thursday morning at 8 a.m. when I release another episode. Take care now. Have a good one, friends.